one and we're on. We are live. Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Leon Goldberg and I have the pleasure of moderating an all star panel today that will be tackling an urgent issue. How do we make the recovery from COVID-19 sustainable, just and resilient? I am the editor of the UN and Global Affairs website, UN Dispatch, and I am the host of the Global Dispatches podcast, which is a leading global affairs news show. And this conversation today is being recorded as a live virtual taping of the Global Dispatches podcast. And this conversation is also being co-hosted with the Leadership Group for Industry Transition in partnership with the Stockholm Environment Institute, or SEI. And before we start the panel, I would like to turn the screen over to Andrea Lindblom of SEI for a few remarks about the Leadership Group for Industry Transition. And she will also explain how you in the audience can participate in this discussion. You will also, throughout this conversation, periodically potentially hear me refer to Ian. This is Ian Caldwell, who's the producer of this episode. So, Ian, please turn the screen over to Andrea. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Mark, for the introduction. A warm welcome from me as well on behalf of the Leadership Group for Industry Transition. My name is Andrea Lindblom. I lead communications for the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, or lead it. And I'm based at Stockholm Environment Institute, which hosts the LEADIT Secretariat. The Leadership Group for Industry Transition was launched by the governments of Sweden and India with support from the World Economic Forum at the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Summit in September 2019. LEADIT members are countries and companies committed to the notion that energy intensive industry can and must progress on low carbon pathways aiming to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The Leadership Group for Industry Transition is grounded in the conviction that partnership between the public and private sectors is key to achieving industry transition. And that's why we are very, very, very pleased to bring together here the Swedish government, environment and climate minister and deputy prime minister Isabella Levin, and one of our company members, Scania, represented by its president and CEO, Henrik Henriksson. We're also excited to have Rachel Kite with us, the leading advocate for sustainable development, now Dean of the Fletcher School for Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and Michael Lazarus of SEI, a leading expert on energy and climate policy, including how fossil fuel production can be aligned with climate targets. Lead it wants to catalyze leadership. And one way we do that is by convening high level dialogues like this webinar. We're looking forward to hearing both your insights and recommendations over the next 75 minutes to improve our collective understanding of the challenges and opportunities the world is facing now when it comes to making the COVID-19 recovery sustainable, just and resilient. Before I turn over to Mark again, uh, just a few organizational details. So this is set up as a classic panel discussion, if you will. Mark will set the scene. Um, he'll then moderate a discussion with our panelists for roughly half an hour. We do have an agenda here somewhere on the slides. Maybe we can see that. Uh, that would be easier for everyone to follow, just so that you have the timing uh, a little bit in front of your eyes. But if we don't have that, um, let me just jump right into the house rules and, and how the discussion works. So during the panel discussion, uh, you, dear audience, will already be able to post questions in the chat by using the Q&A function. However, we will only start getting to uh, we will only start getting your questions to the panelists once we get to the Q&A part of this webinar. So again, this is roughly a half hour from now. Um, that's when we'll start getting your questions that you are very welcome to enter into the chat um, to the panelists. When you do post questions, please let us know your name, what organization you're with, make your questions short and clear and your posts will not appear automatically. We will have to publish them first, but we will do our best to get as many questions to our panelists as we can. Um, before we wrap up the event, the last question to panelists will not come from the audience. It will come from Mark, who will then conclude an event that we hope will be both lively 
and enlightening. Thank you. Over to you again, Mark. Thank you, Andrea. And I, I'm very excited. We have over 400 people attending this live taping of the podcast. So welcome, everyone. Uh, and I think the reason that this there are so many people tuning in today is just the timeliness of what we have in front of us. The latest data from the World Health Organization includes over 3 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide, nearly 200,000 deaths. But even as institutions and governments around the world confront this health crisis, they are also preparing and implementing plans for economic stimulus and recovery. I mean, just over the last few days, we have seen a flurry of activity. Here in the United States, US Congress is in the process of negotiating potentially another stimulus bill following the nearly $2 trillion bill passed in March. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, there is ongoing discussion about the size and contours of that relief package. And uh, just last week, there was this rather contentious, seemingly, meeting between EU leaders who met virtually to discuss that nearly trillion euro package. And then just yesterday evening, April 28th, environment ministers from 30 countries concluded the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, where they discussed directly how to organize a green recovery. The point is, all of these debates about economic recovery and how to shape it and whether or not it will be embedded with principles of environmental sustainability, these conversations are happening right now. There is a narrow policy window that is open in which we can get these questions right, in which we can build a sustainable, resilient, and just recovery from COVID-19. We know that the recovery will take many, many years, but the opportunity to shape that recovery is happening now. So to that end, I am pleased to introduce the panel once again, and we're from all around the world right now. We have uh, from Stockholm, Ms. Isabella Lovin, the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden and Minister of for the Environment and Climate. Welcome, Minister. Also from Stockholm, we have Henrik Henriksson, President and CEO of Scania. And joining us from Massachusetts is Rachel Kite, Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And from Seattle is Michael Lazarus, Senior Scientist and Director of the U.S. Center for SEI. Welcome to everyone, and let's kick off this conversation. Uh, so my first question is to you, Minister Lovin. This is not how 2020 was supposed to go down. 2020 was supposed to be the big year for the environment with a number of key moments, key meetings on the international agenda. COVID-19 has disrupted that among many other things around the world. I'm curious to learn directly from you, how has the pandemic interrupted or affected or impacted your work for climate and the environment? So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark, uh, and thank thanks so much for arranging this very important seminar. Well, we're as you say, we we are all uh, in an unprecedented global crisis right now with COVID-19. But at the same time, we have another global crisis that we all share, which which is the, the climate crisis, and we we can't forget about that uh, when we are trying to to combat uh, this virus that knows no borders, but climate change and the climate crisis does not know any borders uh, as well. So, as you said, uh, this year we would uh, have had the uh, COP26 in Glasgow with enhanced ambitions on climate, but also the summit in, uh, in China uh, on setting new targets for protecting biodiversity. And we also have a biodiversity crisis globally, as you know. Any other meetings, important meetings on, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, setting a global framework for uh, chemicals and waste, uh, the UN Global Oceans Conference that was supposed to be held in Portugal, all of these meetings have been postponed. So basically what we're trying to do is making sure that we keep our eyes on the on the ball so that ball, someone doesn't kick it off the um, the field because uh, we need to solve all these crises uh, simultaneously and not forget about the extremely important work that we've uh, all committed to when it comes to uh, environmental and climate sustainability. 
Um, I think one interesting point when we're just in the middle of this crisis is that we should not repeat the, the mistakes that were made during, off, during and after the financial crisis that we had recently. Uh, during that crisis, emissions fell globally, but then all these stimulus packages came along and uh, the year after the, well in 2011, globally the emissions uh, rose by some 4 to 5 percent. Now we've seen the expectations for this year is that uh, globally the emissions will go down by some 5 percent. I think many uh, of us that are very uh, engaged in climate maybe are a little bit surprised by that small number because all the aeroplanes are now grounded. We see lockdowns in all, almost all countries uh, and that would only result in a decrease in emissions in 5%. And I think that exactly that figure stresses the importance of the lead it initiative that we need not only to do less of our activities that we normally do, but we need to do them differently. We have to do a transition and that goes for the heavy industries such as steel, cement, concrete, uh, aviation and transport, of course, agriculture, all these sectors need to be transformed. So to answer your question, what we try to do is to keep the momentum and always try to keep uh, the uh, the green transition, the sustainability transition into uh, the responses that are made now to the COVID-19 crisis. And we're, we're uh, allying with other ministers in the EU uh, to keep the Green Deal at the center of the response for the COVID-19 crisis, economic crisis. We're 19 ministers now that have signed up and, and are really urging the Commission to to be very firm and, and, and have the Green Deal as the, the fundament of a recovery package, uh, but also, of course, working, reaching out with the like-minded all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. And and I, I will uh, ask you more about EU involvement in, in a little bit, but I'm glad that you also referenced the need for industry transition because uh, that leads into my question to Henrik Henriksen. Scania is a major manufacturer of commercial vehicles and equipment and prior to all this was invested heavily in sustainable transport solutions. Uh, can you give me an example of how the pandemic is impacting those investments? Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I would say those specific investments that goes into our uh, portfolio of uh, new products and solutions to drive uh, the shift towards more sustainable transport solutions, that part of our portfolio is actually untouchable. Uh, we have ring fenced that and we will not touch it uh, going forward. And um, I think as a commitment and as an example of this commitment towards the sustainability agenda in our company, I'm proud today actually specifically today actually to, to announce that we are uh, uh, got approval for our science-based targets um, which means that we have now uh, targets that are in line with with science to meet the, the one and a half degree target that we agreed upon in Paris and and that basically our business plan between 2015 up to 2025 uh, 2025, um, is now confirmed by science and, and uh, that means that we are as a company then committing that uh, in our own operation we should do reductions of 50 percent of uh, CO2 in this time period, uh, the 10 years, so well in line with the so-called carbon law. Uh, but we will also, and I think this is maybe the more um, sort of um, critical commitment in, in this uh, that is that we will also commit ourselves in the so-called scope free targets, which means that what our products when we produce trucks and buses, our production is only representing like 5% of our CO2 footprint of the life cycle of those vehicles. 95% happens out on the road and, and with our scope free commitment, what we're doing actually is that we're making a commitment on behalf of our customers, the one that are running the transport that we should together with them then we commit as Scania to reduce the CO2 emissions with 20%. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I think, an example of our commitment and, and these science-based targets then are, are the sort of the framework for when we are taking our 
decisions when it comes to, for example, investments, like you mentioned, Mark, and, and guiding us in the right direction. So, so that is, uh, I think, the reason why these investments for providing a more sustainable transport system, uh, they are influenced and, and they are now sort of linked directly to the science-based targets that is then confirmed by, by science. Uh, well, thank you, and I'm glad that you used this as the opportunity to make the announcement about <laughs> your, uh, your science-based targets confirmation. We now have over 500 people joining the live stream. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my next question is to Dean Rachel Kite. I, I wanted to bring this conversation global. We are now five years into the Paris Agreement and the also the Sustainable Development Goals, which call for worldwide sustainable energy transition, specifically goal number seven for those SDG nerds out there. Uh, what is one way that you have seen the pandemic impact progress towards these goals? Well, I think that uh, we're, well, most countries in the world are in um, a scramble to respond to the actual public health dimension of the pandemic and the very first responses uh, that need to happen in order to get uh, uh, people protected and to make sure that safety nets are working. So we're in this first phase really of uh, relief or of rescue and now the planning is starting to you know we're starting to think more about what recovery is going to look like and of course countries are very focused uh, on their you know their in the, the situation that they are uh, in and because of the impact of the crisis in the United States and in Europe and East Asia a lot of the headlines are being dominated by that story but I think what we're just beginning to realize is what the dimension of the pandemic is going to mean for uh, the economies and for the well-being of societies in the emerging markets so for example in the last few weeks alone we've seen commodity prices drop by over 20 percent we've seen a drying up of remittances so money traveling from people working in one economy to their families in another we've seen a drying up of remittances unprecedented in the history of remittances and and now we're starting to see capital flight so people bringing their money back and investing at home or needing it uh, uh, for, for, for other purposes and so for a number of developing countries not only are they being hit by a pandemic which they are ill prepared for from a public health perspective but they're they are being hit again and again and again by um, by the economic implications and so you know we're looking at uh, really quite daunting numbers from the IMF in terms of uh, contraction of the global economy um, uh, at the moment the IMF is sort of projecting that in 2021 there'll be some kind of recovery five percent growth I think um, there are some real question marks over that as they start to process the data that's coming in from around the world so we are now looking at recessions and what we really fear is that we could be on the edge of a global depression. And so therefore the question is, how do you make sure that you stimulate the economy now so that you're taking care of people, you're making sure that we can cope with the lack of inclusiveness in our economies, which has been laid bare by this pandemic? How do you sort of stand up the public health responses that you need? But, and how do you make sure you do no harm in the short term response to the long term need mm -hmm. for recovery? And that recovery is going to have to build in much more resilience into the economy, resilience mm -hmm. to current shocks, but to future shocks, especially climate change. But it's also going to have to mean that our societies are more equitable and fairer. And I think that both um, there is both an opportunity to build a fairer set of economies and a greener set of economies as we gear out of the current crisis. Uh, thank you. And Michael, uh, Rachel just referenced the need to avoid short term harm. Uh, you know, as we enter this recovery phase, it's clear that there will be competition between industries and between priorities in, in craft and government support. And presumably this also includes the fossil fuel industry and other carbon intensive industries. To what extent do you think that this moment poses a risk that recovery may in fact favor carbon intensive industries? You might need to unmute Michael. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, it happens so everywhere. Yeah, yeah, Mark, that, the last thing we need right now is more risk uh, in our economies and work. And um, 
you know, unfortunately, the moment does also pose a very high risk of favoring carbon intensive industries, especially oil and gas in ways that we don't necessarily want to see. Um, that's a product in part of not just the oil market crash we've seen, but the tight connections between that industry and governments around the world. And that in turn can lead to what you just mentioned, deeper carbon lock-in. You know, at SEI, we just launched a new initiative on confronting carbon lock-in, the ways that fossil fuel and carbon intensive systems persist and perpetuate themselves technologically, institutionally, politically locking out the kind of swift low carbon transition we'll, we're going to need to see. So you ask for examples, I think the most, uh, perhaps the most obvious type of example that we're only just beginning to see, as Rachel pointed out, we're just beginning to enter the recovery phase is coming from commitments to new long lived high carbon infrastructure like oil fields and pipelines. And one of the most concerning examples that we've seen so far comes from the Canadian province of Alberta where the government just invested directly a billion dollars and another four billion in loan guarantees to complete the Keystone XL pipeline. And that's that's important because it could bring another 800,000. Oh. I think Michael dropped off. We'll move on. Uh, Isabella Lovin, can you can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, OK, apologies for this interruption. Uh, Michael's line seemed to have dropped, so I'll, I'll move on uh, to a question to you. So in your opening remarks, you referenced the need to avoid mistakes of the past, referencing the, the recovery from 2008 and the financial crisis. Uh, you know, to that end, I am interested in getting your take on how the European Union is faring so far in terms of crafting a common response. You know, it's seemingly a, a rather fraught process right now. Uh, every report that I've read from that teleconference between EU leaders on that trillion euro recovery package seemed to exposed kind of traditional fault lines between North and South in the EU. And then on top of that, you have some other governments like Poland who don't seem to care too much about including green initiatives as part of a recovery package. So what do you think are the prospects for EU unity on sustainable recovery measures right now? What do you think the EU should do right now? Well, first of all, uh, um, Okay, you're, you're cracking up a little bit there, but uh, I, as I understood, the question was about the EU response and how we can, how we can uh, really uh, do this together. And and uh, I think to uh, many of us, it was quite a shock uh, in the beginning of this crisis that uh, the EU solidarity and unity was not uh, proven from the the best side when we, we couldn't really confront this uh, this extreme crisis together, but there were export restrictions, the, the open market didn't function the way that, that it should when it came to medical supplies, protection um, uh, materials that was desperately needed in, in all countries or and some of them uh, more than others in the beginning. And uh, I think very much of the let's say the core of the EU uh, spirit and the unity is very much under under stress right now. And we need to make sure that we we protect the EU, the EU values, uh, because they're needed more than ever uh, in this time of multiple crises. Uh, we have also a lot an attack on, on democracy. Uh, we can see uh, that inside Europe, but we also see it very much outside. Uh, and the, the pandemic is also opening up for many very harsh uh, uh, measures that would be unthinkable, would have been unthinkable before this pandemic. But in some uh, places uh, that is used for using a lot of control over citizens uh, and limiting uh, the freedom and space of, of citizens, etc. And I see that also as a risk within the European Union. So 
we need to, to keep together. I think uh, it's very positive that uh, we started with a um, uh, uh, an article um, 30 where we were 10 ministers from the beginning and then uh, Germany and, and France also joined not only Nordic countries uh, but also from the south Italy Greece Portugal Spain really uh, stressing the need for the Green Deal uh, to be at the center of a, a recovery plan for the EU uh, now we have been joined by more countries, not uh, the eastern countries though, uh, and, and that's a, a very, uh, I think, a true observation from your side. Uh, so the divide is both economically, but also uh, I would say the uh, conviction that a transition to a green and climate friendly economy uh, it are, are differing from uh, uh, different parts of Europe. And we've heard from the Prime Minister of, of uh, the Czech Republic and even the Deputy Minister from, from Poland saying that, well, we should just uh, leave uh, the Green Deal aside now and just concentrate on, on recovery and the economy. So we need uh, we need, of course, a lot of um, solidarity. We need money, but we also need to focus on what is really needed now in the European Union. And I think we need to reevaluate some of the, the old measures that uh, uh, is costing a lot in the European budget, uh, for instance, within the agricultural policy and focus on real, real sustainability when we uh, give incentive packages for the economy to, for it to be really sustainable this time. And just just to probe you further, do you actually see a prospect for unity and solidarity? Do you see that as a potential outcome right now? Everything we've seen seems to indicate the opposite. I think you're absolutely right, and we're struggling with that. We're fighting for for that, and and trying to also protect what is the the free and open market. Sweden is an extremely uh, export dependent uh, country, so our economy is really dependent on an open and free, but also fair, of course, uh, market. And the European Union is the the most important market for us. Um, but we also see uh, the European Union uh, as uh, the beacon right now when it comes to protecting democracy, the freedom of speech, uh, gender equality, all these uh, things that are being questioned right now all, all over the world. So uh, for us, for Sweden, it's extremely important that we keep together. And of course, we regret that we have all this, the, the, the Brexit crisis prior to this, and we're still negotiating the Brexit mm -hmm. uh, agreement. And that also takes a lot of energy, uh, unfortunately, uh, from the, the EU uh, uh, machinery, so to speak. Uh, my next question is for Rachel Kite. Uh, Dean Kite, you, you opened your uh, this conversation describing all of the you know, negative impacts that this crisis is having on all sorts of sectors around the world, from a cop, from commodities to remittances. Uh, what examples have you seen so far of governments or institutions or entities that are seemingly rising to this moment and thinking through of des and designing? Uh, sustainable and just and resilient recoveries to this crisis. Are there any kind of examples out there that you could cite that we might look to as ways that as governments or institutions that are getting this right so far? Uh, you might need to unmute. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought I had. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, so I think that uh, it's very early days, so we're just seeing um, the, the response from different governments, but I think it was very important to see the South Korean government go through an election and then come out with its Green New Deal. Um, South Korea is an important industrial country. It has gone through an extraordinary transition in the last 30 years, um, but it, is be, it has been coal dependent and it has been financing exports of coal technology as well. So I think that that's uh, very important. I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm an EU, well, I was an EU citizen no longer now, 
not living in the EU, but I think that the EU's rhetorical commitment to not letting go of the ambitious targets as the EU thinks through how to respond is critically important. And of course, all eyes are on China, which has come out with announcements in the last few days around massive inf investment in infrastructure, which still would appear to be green. And of course, we're all waiting for the 14th five-year plan, which really will show how far they will keep going. So China facing a recovery Recovery, but but indicating that it's going to invest in the green infrastructure. In the US, obviously, the headlines often get dominated by the news conferences in Washington. But at the local level, you see um, states, governors uh, and companies trying to look through what is the best form of stimulus. And really what you're looking at is what creates jobs now, the shovel ready jobs that you need immediately, but which will be for green infrastructure, which will be favoring um, a renewable energy over the uh, past and old economy, which we can't have, we can't, we can't continue to support. Uh, but also things related to um, uh, regenerative agriculture. I think that the public is not only shocked by the health dimensions of this crisis, but they're also shocked by how vulnerable our food systems are. And so, from you know. Um, uh, real calls for help to support the food security of sub-Saharan Africa to the fact that we have nine mile, 10 mile, 15 mile lines of cars in the United States of people on low income queuing up for food parcels. This has really shocked people. So can we think about locally based economies that help people get back to work, but will also be part of more sustainable global supply chains? So you're starting to see those conversations happen, and I would expect to see more. So, Henrik, uh, Rachel just referenced, obviously, the need to get people back to work. Um, you are the CEO and president of a major employer. Uh, what would be your ideal recovery plan for industry more broadly, for getting people back to work? What would be included in it? What outcome would it be would be achieved? And specifically, what would you want from government and from the EU or other institutions? Mm -hmm. So good question. I, um, I think that we are currently, um, most companies around the world, uh, we are still in a liquidity crisis, which means that it's all about cash flow. It's about trying to sort of stop the drainage in the company. Um, and we are getting fairly good support, I would say, in most parts of the world when it comes to short term packages to make sure that we avoid the layoffs of, of our people. So. Of course, these two uh, are, are going hand in hand. So, so, uh, but already now we need, of course, to look at the next phase, which will be not the liquidity crisis, but rather a demand crisis, where we will see that the long-term demand for products and services in in industry and society will go down, and and then there will be a need for restructuring of the companies. Uh, there will be a need to sort of rebalance to to a new sort of uh, um, uh, operating level. Um, I think it, it's starting now to to become a little bit clearer on on what that new level will be. Uh, I think two months ago or two weeks ago, maybe the scenario was minus 50 to minus 30. I think now we're starting to sort of narrow down that uh, bandwidth. Um, so what we would need then uh, as a support is is of course a short term in the liquidity crisis is to make sure that we get access to capital uh, that we take away a lot of red tape and and that the process of distributing capital is quick and neat. And, and I think in our case, we we, we need to support our customers. Uh, so even if we are a big company, we can support the smaller companies that are transport companies by extending payment terms on, on uh, sort of finance they have. We can support our suppliers that are usually smaller companies as well, and also our dealerships that are smaller companies. So I think in each industry vertical, you have the opportunity then to, to distribute liquidity, and, and that needs to happen quickly. Then we're coming to the demand side, and I think there, there we need the programs and then we need, uh, as have been said uh, today, uh, I mean, we need to build that then on, on like in Europe on the Green Deal and we need to build it on a sustainability platform. I mean, that there is, um, uh, I mean, sustainability is, is, is not a trend and I mean, it, it's, it's a condition for future business success and, and, and I think that is clear both for politicians and, and for the business. So there, I think that the biggest hurdle will not be access to money to pump into infrastructure. Uh, I think it will be uh, the decision power that the, that the governments and politicians have. And I can just refer to many of the European countries where 
where we are sort of rather held back to do big uh, investments in, in, for example, production of sustainable biofuels that we can use in our trucks or buses, or infrastructure to charge electrical buses and trucks along the highways. Uh, it is not the money that is the problem. It is the process of making those decisions that takes too long. There we need like a Marshall Plan or something like that, but not Marshall Plan when it comes to money, Marshall Plan when it comes to a uh, sort of uh, carte blanche to sort of uh, go straight through the, the legal system and, and get decisions uh, uh, within one or two quarters. Uh, thank you. And uh, just a quick note to the audience, please do get your questions in. In a few minutes, we'll be opening it up to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to turn to Michael now. You know, everything that, that Henrik said obviously requires capital, requires money. Uh, part of the negotiations over these recovery plans necessarily include or might include some sort of taxation or subsidy reform. What opportunities right now do you see for a shift in taxation policies and subsidy reforms? What happens if we lose revenue from a uh, drive from taxes on, on fossil fuels, for example? How are we going to pay for this all? Great question. Um, I apologize for the loss of internet a while back, so I'm not exactly sure um, what when it cut off. But um, I think one one of we do obviously have an opportunity with the drop in global oil prices that will probably not return for maybe a year uh, at, at 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 the minimum. We have an opportunity to um, increase, remove subsidies first of all, and then consider actually duties on oil and gas that can help support the kinds of investments we need to see happen. Um, perhaps even uh, carbon pricing, although obviously that's a bit of a stretch right now for a lot of uh, the bandwidth of a lot of governments right now. Um, fossil fuel subsidies as of last year were still about $400 billion per year around the world. And so this is obviously a place where um, some uh, some action is possible. Um, the the challenge is to do it in a way that that uh, that respects the fact that we don't want to increase prices and costs for the most vulnerable, especially those reeling in the global south uh, right now. And so to do it in in a fashion that that works. But a fair amount of these subsidies also go. Uh, to production as well as consumption of fossil fuels. And it's important to recognize that those subsidies have a long-term impact, that we're going to be shooting ourselves in the foot in this recovery if we support lots of long-lived investments in upstream oil, gas, and coal uh, infrastructure at this point in time. So the opportunity is significant. I think we've seen India already raise uh, duties on on petrol and uh, to to help cover the costs of this recovery. So I think that the, the, the space is open for that. Uh, thank you. So I will pose one more question to Minister Lovin uh, before we'll open it up to the audience to take your questions. And there are several hundred of you out there. Feel, feel free to pose your question in the chat box. Uh, Minister Lovin, you know, Right now, uh, people are looking to their governments for action and policymaking in government, of course, as you well know, requires balancing competing interests and compromising. What are you doing to make sure that the process uh, is undertaking right now is inclusive and will lead to a better outcome? Uh, Mr. Henriksen referred to the need to streamline processes what are you in the Swedish government doing to ensure that that process is inclusive and that process leads to an outcome that is what we're all here to talk about, a just, resilient and more sustainable world? Well, first, first of all, just uh, let me state immediately. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes loud yes. and clear. Well, OK, that uh, I mean, this crisis here is is absolutely unprecedented. So the first weeks, uh, this first month and a half, we've been totally immersed in uh, having to take decisions on on really saving lives, trying to contain the, the spread of the virus, saving companies and jobs that would otherwise have been bankrupt within uh, a month or, or so. 
we have a, a huge crisis also when it comes to uh, unemployment, uh, uh, raising un unemployment, and, and of course we're, we're doing every, everything we can to protect our economy. Uh, and uh, the next phase will be uh, to see, okay, so how are we going to rebuild our economy and our, our countries stronger and more resilient? And all these questions that have been made uh, just now, uh, Rachel mentioned food security. Uh, we also are very dependent on, on global uh, value chains, uh, such as uh, Scania and Volvo and some of our biggest industries, they had to ba basically uh, close down the production within a week, not due to the measures that we, we took in, in Sweden because of, of, of lack of uh, availability on, on the global market where uh, country after country is, is closed down. So we're very, very interdependent in the world. I think that's a realization. and how to rebuild in, a, in an inclusive manner. Well, I think uh, in almost every country you can feel the, the sense of, of urgency where we need to work together. And uh, political parties are, I would say, quite uh, united in Sweden that we need to really make this work for the sake of, of our people. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the next step will, of course, be uh, the recovery of the economy. But we're not quite there yet, actually. And uh, I mean, during these six weeks, we've come out with recovery packages of, of billions of Swedish kroners, uh, which are quite unprecedented. But I think in the next phase, we will be able to talk about conditionality on sustainability, for instance, and, and other criteria. But I think there's a window here, as ha has been said, uh, and I think we need to make sure we use this window rightly so we can address two, at least two crises at the same time. Thank you. Uh, let's now turn the screen over to Andrea Lindblom. Uh, who will take questions from the audience. And I also need to unmute myself. Um, so we've already have a lot of, of questions coming in. Um, there's 47 uh, that we've already published. Please do understand we can only take questions that are short and clear and, and to our topic. Uh, one of the, quest the, the question that I would like to start with comes from Will Hall. He represents uh, Terry, a key uh, partner stakeholder in the leadership group for industry transition and opens this up to, um, to an aspect of the world that uh, or an area of the world that um, so far we haven't looked at so much. And his question is, over the coming decades, the majority of industrial emissions are likely to come from developing countries as they satisfy demands for cement, steel and petrochemicals. Given the tight timelines for transition and bearing in mind their vulnerability to COVID-19, how can we bring developing countries into this conversation now to ensure net zero near to 2050? And I think that can go to Rachel, that question. Well, it's a great question, Will. Um, and I actually, just before I came on to this uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, conversation, I was participating in the Petersburg Climate Dialogues finance conversation, and this is really about what the Secretary General called for yesterday uh, in a sort of very robust sort of six-point plan needed for the recovery to make sure that it's climate resilient. And he talked about using all of our fiscal firepower to uh, make sure that in recovery we, we, we um, bend the curb of emissions and build more resilient economies. So I think the developing world is in this conversation already. Now we have this extraordinary opportunity. More than 100 countries have asked the IMF for help. That poses a whole challenge to the structure and well-being of the international financial institutions. That's for another webinar. But we have this opportunity to um, condition that support and provide assistance to to help developing countries move more quickly. So this means laying the groundwork for the shift to um, electric vehicles and to clean vehicles in in public in fleets for the public sector, etc. This requires um, uh, some very careful 
conversations around restructuring if public money that's going in to support public budgets is then going to be used to support national oil and gas companies, for example. So I think there's some very, very detailed restructuring conversations that are going to have to take place as the international community supports these developing countries. It can't be you must not do this with public money. It has to be this is how public money should be used. These are the green conditions and res you know inclusive conditions on that money. And there's going to have to be a lot more help then for resistance. To, to support those countries to move more quickly. That actually asks them two other big questions. How do we restructure the development finance? Uh, the West's development finance is chopped into very lots of little tiny boutique funds. That's not going to be a way to get money to move at speed and scale. And a second question is really um, one of collaboration between China and India, who are big donors now and the West in terms of supporting the poorest countries. I would only say that I don't think we have any idea exactly how to manage this kind of level of sovereign debt. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for green bonds and other things to help. But we are, as the uh, Deputy Prime Minister said, moving into completely unbounded territory. And so we are going to have to do some imaginative and some thinking which would be truly outside of the box. Thank you, Rachel. Is there any other panelists that would like to add? I don't see that. I would uh, then let's see. Uh, let's move on to another question so we can try and get in as many as possible um, here. And I already see that this will be impossible. Um, but uh, Michael Shahana, and I don't have any other affiliation for her, um, is asking which mechanism can be recommended for economies where the oil and gas sector is driving and investment into renewables mainly depends on income generated through fossil fuels to make the COVID-19 recovery more sustainable and resilient? Well, that's a great question because um, you know, there's a, a wide range of countries around the world in terms of their dependency on fossil fuels. You know, the U.S. is now the number one producer of oil and uh, and gas and fossil fuels in the sense overall, uh, but ultimately is not that dependent overall on the revenues from oil and gas production on a national basis. So um, in some countries can move more quickly on this. So in terms of transitioning and expecting, um, uh, you know, in terms of directing investment, I think you look at countries like Iraq, Nigeria, where You've got 90% dependency, 70% uh, dependency on, on oil revenues. They're in quite a predicament. Um, you know, you do have the, the opportunity to reduce subsidies that are directed in some of the countries that produce the most, subsidize the most, and low oil prices provides the opportunity to raise some funds in that mechanism, although a diff difficult time to do that. Um, and I think it is a time that's going to require some international cooperation to help out those countries that are deeply dependent um, and, and need more time to transition their economies away from oil and gas. Thank you, Michael. Um, one question here, I think, for, um, for Minister uh, Isabella Levine would come from Rachel at the University of York. As we're seeing levels of poverty and inequality drastically increasing um, globally, how are social justice measures such as equity and human dignity being considered in COVID-19 policy responses? Are they being discussed at this time? Uh, thank you so much for that important question. And of course, uh, we're at a very early stage so far, but we can already uh, see that uh, this is not a virus that hits uh, everyone equally, even though, of course, no one is immune at this stage. But uh, we can see also within our, our country, a very wealthy country with uh, a very developed social security system that we've had the outbreaks in uh, uh, areas where people have a lower income and uh, um, are more exposed to the virus than than in other uh, in other areas where you you don't have a, as much contact with other people and you don't have maybe you have the opportunity not to uh, uh, go to work if if you uh, have the economic possibility so i think uh, this this virus will 
also lead to further uh, discussions on the need to address, I would say, all the Agenda 2030 on the sustainability uh, goals that we adopted in 2015. We can't really avoid a uh, health crisis without uh, dealing with all of the SDGs. So we need to make sure that we uh, treat animals uh, uh, better and we have better food production. We need to also uh, organize our cities better. Uh, we need to reduce the, the income inequalities, uh, not only uh, between countries, but also within countries. And I think um, that is for the security of, of, us, of all of us. Uh, and uh, this is really a, a crisis where we can put everything on the table and, and see whether or not the way we are living our lives now is sustainable or not. And obviously the answer is no. We have a lot of uh, work to do to make our societies more sustainable and resilient and more fair. Thank you so much for that. There is another question coming in uh, for you from Yulia Rashevska, and that is on a on a very different uh, level, but I'd still like to put it to you at this stage. It's it's more on a practical level regarding the um, EU sort of um, workings and um, asks how could we persuade the reluctant Eastern European countries to join us in the effort to rebuild the economy in a greener and more inclusive way? Well, I think uh, the best way to do that is to uh, really show by doing yourself. And uh, Sweden and other countries are really, uh, I think, moving forward. As we heard with Henrik Henriksson, we have uh, large parts of our industry with us, uh, convinced that it's not uh, a burden to do a green transition, but it's an opportunity. Um, what was mentioned just uh, just now earlier on the uh, dependency of fossil fuels in some of the world's economies that just shows that it's it's not uh, the future. It's not going to be uh, those that are stuck with uh, with the fossil fuels the the longest are not going to be the winners. The contrary, they are going to be stuck with stranded assets and have uh, huge problems with that. So I think. The initiative of, of Lead It uh, is a very, very important one where we have gathered together a lot of uh, companies, also countries, uh, heavy industries that will are willing to show leadership and really invest in uh, technology leaps, showing that it's possible to produce steel without having uh, coal in the, in the, in the furnaces, uh, showing that it's possible to produce cement in, uh, in with uh, a lot less uh, emissions of, of CO2 in the process. Those uh, types of, of showing by example are extremely important to get the more reluctant uh, countries and leaders on board. So um, we need to continue this initiative. I'm very proud that Sweden and, and India have been uh, um, asked by the Secretary General to lead this initiative and, and we will sure continue to do it. Uh, we were supposed to present something in COP26 in Glasgow this winter, but it will be postponed. But we will continue uh, and, and also encourage others to join the, this initiative because it's really by by showing, by forward-looking com companies as, as Scania and others uh, can convince uh, their um, their colleagues in other countries that this is the way to go and it's really uh, the way to to be prosperous to do it. Andrea Hen Henrik here, can I just uh, add on to that uh, uh, hands-on example? I think that when it comes to the Eastern European uh, countries in, in the European Union, I think that uh, what, one example of where we could um, sort of create an initiative that, that will boost uh, the interest in any in green transition is of course the bioeconomy. I think the bioeconomy is a fantastic lever for us to create growth uh, in Europe uh, and especially in the eastern part of Europe. One example is that um, we have um, uh, a lot of contaminated land uh, as, as a result of the, the former industrial era uh, 50, 60 years ago in, in that part of, of Europe, which means that we cannot use the, the, the land to, to grow uh, crop for, for uh, food for animals or, or for people. But that land could be used in a sustainable way to produce then uh, 
uh, the second generation or third generation of, of biofuels that we could use for the transport sector and put that into to vehicles that are already out on the road uh, running. Uh, it doesn't have to be new technology that I have to wait for. It could be a plug and play today. If we would do that, and I think that that is not a, a basic industry, that's a high tech industry, uh, which I think we could create uh, job opportunities and uh, in the countryside uh, and also an opportunity to, to excel in technology and digitalization. So I think I agree with the minister. I think there are good examples that we should uh, explore. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, for, for that, and um, if, if I may, I, I'd like to um, ask another question um, that I have seen very early on in the chat, but now that I'm scrolling back to 57 messages, can't exactly uh, find it and, and pin down the exact way that it was phrased, but it went uh, and it was around the way that um, multinational uh, corporations now have to change their supply chains. So how is that change happening in supply chains to towards more resiliency? Can you give an example of where you see that going maybe in your company? Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, uh, of course, a crisis like this um, uh, questions your, your uh, uh, footprint of sourcing. And, and the, what I think the result will be, at least in the uh, heavy commercial vehicle industry and probably in the automotive industry as well, that we are going Unfortunately, which is against my belief, but we're going towards the regionalization. I would prefer that they went the other way to, to a globalization, but I think we see an, an regionalization and that means that we will see clusters of, of uh, sort of uh, industry uh, ecosystems then uh, that will become more regional. So I think that is that is one trend. However, of course, the good thing with those uh, systems would be that uh, they could be um, uh, more efficient from a well-to-wheel perspective, uh, considering also transport. Uh, and, and also, if you start looking at putting a price on carbon, for example, 100 euro per ton, uh, which we are doing in, in, in our sort of judgment of different alternatives, then you can see uh, that, that uh, of course, the regionalization also from a well-to-wheel and also taking into consideration uh, this uh, society and, and sustainability uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so uh, I think that is uh, a trend that we will see uh, going forward in many industries. Thank you so much for that. Um, is there anyone else in the panel that um, would like to add um, from a, you know, from the wider than the company perspective, maybe? Rachel? Well, I, I mean, I think Henrik is absolutely right. And I think this trend to regionalization um, would would seem to be it was already probably happening and will be spurred forward by this crisis and then i think there's a question of if you imagine the world with a sort of a, a china dominated sort of region eu and then the, you know the us then um i think there's a this leaving no one behind and making sure that um developing countries uh are uh, able to to operate in a world that's dominated by three pacts that will start um, uh, moving away from each other, I think, in some respects, in particular particular you know, public attitudes to AI and public surveillance and things like this. So I think there's, there's, there's a very interesting period ahead of us. But resilience, I think, uh, the public's imagination around resilience has really been sparked by this crisis. And so this means we always knew, for example, that electricity uh, grids uh, complemented by microgrids and off-grid electricity production gave you the most resilience. We saw that after some of the big hurricanes and superstorms of the last 15 years. And I think there's something attractive to communities to know that they can get power locally as well as, you know, be part of a global grid or a, a sorry, a, a regional or national grid, you know, when they see how, um, how extenuated and how fragile some of our supply chains are. Same with food, you know, you, it's, it's all very well and good to have, you know, a global uh, food production system that means that wheat and soy and everything go halfway around the world and a lot of your food is coming and foodstuffs are coming from China. But then in the middle of what is now only can be described as a kind of cold war between the West and China as we try to work out 
do we trust each other how do we work with each other then being able to get more of your supply locally and to have it be healthy and nutritious is going to be an important part of this the question really will be how to make that all affordable and how to make sure that that is something that works for everybody but i think that there is a, a mindset shift in the public's imagination that can be exploited by policymakers in order to make sure that this recovery works to be more resilient cleaner uh, and healthier you mentioned the word uh, affordable oh minister levine you you want to add to that well yes no but, but i think um, what this crisis has revealed has been quite shocking to many of us that uh, for instance uh, the, the the most basic health material medical supplies uh, would not reach uh, us in, in in europe when when we needed face masks there there were no face masks etc and and it has taken a, a lot of time and effort and trying to figure out how we can uh, ask uh, companies and industries in Sweden to start producing them here and I, I'm quite sure that, that we will have a very different uh, view on uh, um, let's say safety and, and security after the COVID-19 crisis uh, and, and security is not only military security it's also about being more self-sufficient and that's one point the other point is that also maybe uh, our trust in the open market has really had a real hit uh, during this crisis and at the end of the day it's the institutions that have been able to really uh, help us uh, uh, and, and, and face this crisis where markets have failed and I think that was, will also be a lesson learned from the, from the crisis and uh, I think it's the same with uh, the climate crisis because if markets alone uh, would be, let's say, driving uh, in a sensible way, then we would go off uh, fossil fuels a uh, very long time ago because otherwise the fear of stranded assets would really dominate uh, the, the business decisions, but it hasn't. Uh, and we're still there with a lot of, of um, assets that will be stranded if we are going to respect and reach the the, the Paris target but still uh, investors are, are there and that is maybe one of my biggest concerns now that those of us that are already convinced in a long since a long time that we need to do the transition to a fossil free economy uh, we we won't change our mind because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis but those that maybe woke up uh, in Davos in uh, in February, all the investors coming together saying we should divest from fossil fuels, etc. Maybe they're not that uh, convinced uh, at the end of the day, and that is that poses a real threat to the transition because we need investors going in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to pass on uh, from Shirley Matheson at uh, WWF UK um, uh, comment uh, to all of you that this is a very interesting discussion. So thank you for that, Shirley. Uh, she also asks, how can we win the political argument today that this is the time to invest in a just transition across the economy now when we know that governments and citizens are looking for ways to stabilize employment, create and preserve jobs in the short term, and at least in the medium term too, where this implies that more change in employment going forward, including new jobs, but also losses. So how basically this is around this um, uh, image that that Mark um, uh, spelled out in, in the beginning about how this is a, a narrow policy window. So how can we win this political argument today that this is the time to invest in a just transition? Um, Michael, would you have any thoughts on that? Well, sure, it's a little bit out of what, what I typically focus on, but it, it's obviously what we're seeing is that the most marginalized communities around the world are being hit the hardest. It, those uh, workers in our societies that have been chronically underpaid or are the ones who are pitching in the most in the recovery effort. And so I think you're seeing lots of uh, sensibilities around the need for justice here in, in the response. And so, and we're also seeing um, a little bit back to what Minister Levine was talking about moments ago around the fact that I am actually 
I think you will, we'll see a, a general cultural and social response that we don't want to get back on the oil roller coaster. And I think that, that the shocks that are being felt on economies that are highly dependent on, on oil and gas revenues right now, it sends a message that be careful because this is a preview of coming attractions. Um, and um, it, it's quite visceral uh, in those communities as well. Can I just jump in? I think Please. Th th this is primarily a respiratory crisis. And so, you know, the desire to have more filthy uh, carbon pollution is, is going to be seriously affected in, 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 in many developed countries. It's going to be harder in developing countries where, as Michael's already said, they're much more dependent upon uh, oil and, and coal to begin with. But even there, there are things that can be done. But to, I'm back on the question on jobs. I mean, the good news is that the jobs we need, the jobs that we need in order to build the kind of clean economy, resilient economy that we need are, are job rich. So we need deep refurbishment of um, real estate, uh, commercial and residential. We need uh, to have a handbrake turn in our approach to energy efficiency. That is job rich in, in the local economy. We need restorative agriculture. We need to plant trees. We need to uh, you know, protect coastlines. These are job rich enterprises. And if we have also reset our attitude to government that actually there is a fundamental goal, goal for government, that it has to set the direction of travel. It has to use public money to do smart things, not to do stupid things. So no more fossil fuel subsidies, but it also has to use public money to incentivize private action. So there's a lot of guarantees being offered at the moment. Those guarantees can come with conditions to get the private sector to do what we need and to build the private sector we, where we need it. So we can imagine that there is a possibility to invest in the green infrastructure that we need, the green hydrogen infrastructure we need, the renewable energy infrastructure, the grid improvement that we need, that there is an opportunity to, um, to invest in these things with you know, signals from government and that these are job rich. And so that short term recovery, the job, you know, the shovel ready projects, as we described it in 2008, after a very different shock, that those shovel ready, uh, sorry, shovel ready projects, which are job rich, could be on the pathway to a cleaner economy. I think that that is possible. It will require political leadership, no doubt, but it's not impossible. And it, you know, the good news is that it's job rich. Thank you, Rachel, for, for ending uh, that um, Q&A part of our webinar on, on such a positive note. I'd like uh, to turn over uh, now to Mark. It's almost 10 minutes past four. I'd like to turn over to Mark now for a final round of questions to you panelists that he will put to you. Thank you so much for all the questions in the audience. I'm very, very sorry we couldn't um, get to more, but that's where we're at. And now over to Mark. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to everyone in the audience for those thoughtful questions. I have just a final round of questions before we conclude today. Uh, the first is to Henrik Henriksen. Uh, can you make this a little real for us? Can you give us an example, just maybe one example, of what you are doing in your work today at Scania to ensure that the COVID-19 recovery is sustainable? Yeah. Uh what, what we're doing then, I mean, with our purpose to drive the shift towards more sustainable transport uh, solutions, we cannot do that alone. We need to do that together with our customers. They need to demand these kind of solutions, vehicles and solutions that can run on renewables or, or uh, clean uh, electricity. Uh, we need also help from our customers' customers, the ones that are buying the transports, that they specify this when, when they, they buy transport. And we need help from, from academia, to give us science and proofs, and we need policymakers and politicians to, to create long-term rules that allows then investments in, in systems for transition. So I think that um, uh, currently we're working with all these stakeholders uh, with a societal sort of view and, and, and trying to see, even if it's difficult now, I know, with, uh, with the current uh, pandemic and, and the, the health situation, but I think we need to have the strength to work both here and now and, and with a plan of how to sort of restart society in, in a sustainable way. And, and I think what we're spending time on now and doing is, is, is to work with all these stakeholders to come up with, with common agendas of, of how we can uh, create uh, uh, a transition. And, and very much of the time is going to, to reach across the aisle, uh, 
uh, towards uh, policymakers uh, agree on a common agenda and, and drive that together. Uh, thank you. And uh, my final question for Minister Levine. In the Q&A session, uh, you mentioned that one good way to convince reluctant members of the EU on ways that they ought to make the uh, recovery sustainable is to lead by example, to show by an example. So can you give me an example of how the Swedish government has put sustainability at the center of its own recovery efforts? Well, thank you, Mark. Well, just before Christmas, we adopted uh, uh, our major climate action strategy uh, and was adopted by the Swedish parliament. This was, of course, before the COVID-19 pand pand pandemic, but uh, this is still uh, some uh, the, the fundamental uh, roadmap for us for the, the recovery. And this is where the, the, the government aims at uh, uh, doing the major investments uh, uh, and uh, incentivizing the technology leaps that we're seeing within the steel industry, the transport sector, etc. And we uh, we want to invest in a high levels, uh, high speed uh, uh, train uh, that will also we believe spark hundreds of thousands of jobs in the building sector and also provide sustainable uh, transportation with. Now we see no planes are, are uh, lifting off the, the ground anywhere, but in the future we will have to have uh, more uh, sustainable ways of transportation and still Sweden does not have a high speed train, so this is one of the, the major investments we need to do. But we also see thousands of hundreds of thousands of jobs in solar, in energy efficiency, Rachel mentioned refurbishing of, of buildings, uh, renovation of uh, the, the buildings that were built uh, during the 1970s are in a, an acute uh, need of a refurbishing right now. And, and, and that's one of the things that we want to see um, done in a socially inclusive way uh, that is also uh, ecologically and environmentally sustainable. Uh, on the food sector, I think uh, uh, Rachel mentioned it uh, very, uh, described it very well. These are food, these are job-rich sectors: restoration of wetlands, uh, watercourses, uh, and also uh, maintaining uh, our big natural reserves and forests. There's so many jobs uh, that uh, can be created uh, once we roll out uh, this strategy we have for for the climate transition and we should not move away from that when we uh, design the, the the corona uh, recovery package but that should be the foundation of, of the package uh, thank you minister levine uh on to dean rachel kite i'm curious to learn from you how we will know if things are trending in the right direction in terms of towards a sustainable recovery are there any indicators you'll be looking towards in the coming weeks or months ahead or key inflection points that you'll be monitoring that will suggest to you whether or not uh, we are in fact recovering from COVID-19 in a just sustainable way? Well, I don't know if you saw that picture of the goats prancing down the small uh, center of a, a Welsh town, which isn't very far away from where my grandmother comes from, but um, I don't think that's the indicator. Um, but I, I think that there's something profound about being able to look up and, first of all, hear the birds and, and see blue sky. And that's going to have to drive what I think is a fairly significant policy change, which is that since the 1930s, despite warnings, we have used GDP as the measure of success. GDP is a very, very blunt instrument. It first of all doesn't allow you to measure the wealth of the natural environment and it doesn't actually allow you to really invest in the things which we hold dear, which are education and health and our own well-being. And so those governments that have started moving towards well-being budgets and those governments that have put well-being into traditionally structured budgets, I think are on the leading edge of something and honestly, if this is not an existential threat, 
but has driven us to this kind of economic slowdown, when we have truly existential threats ahead of us, it is time to, get, to come together as an international community and, and have a different matrix for the measurements of success. We will have to go beyond GDP. Uh, thank you. And finally, to Michael Lazarus, you know, I kicked off this conversation saying and noting that we have a very narrow policy window to get this right. How will we know if and when this policy window is closing or closed? You know, I'm not really sure how we'll exactly know, but I know that there are going to be many windows that will open and close across regions and likely for years as we move from this relief phase, the recovery phase, to ultimately what we all hope to see, which is a restructuring phase of our economies for this just equitable prosperity and net zero carbon world we're aiming for. You know, clearly this moment is unique. Um, the sheer scale of investment, um, the over $5 trillion uh, that's already been committed by G20 and the debt that Rachel was talking about that is unprecedented that we're taking on. So we need to be prepared with plans and strategies now. Um, we need to put screens in those windows to make sure what we don't want to see doesn't get funded. And we need uh, to condition what we do provide to carbon intensive industries, which we've been talking about, uh, to the kinds of, um, to, to align with the kinds of measures that we heard Henrik talking about at Scania, um, to, to really put in place those deep emission reductions, to fund those kinds of shovel ready projects that Rachel was talking about. And I add to that also, uh, cleaning up of abandoned oil, gas, and coal mines. Uh, there, we, we saw in Canada uh, just recently that Prime Minister Trudeau put two million dollars towards uh, towards that in in Alberta and the oil patch, which will create jobs where they're needed without deepening our investment in future fossil fuel production. We need to take on that 400 billion dollars of, of subsidies, and we have a real opportunity now for carbon pricing as well. Um, and so we need to seize that opportunity. Um, maybe it's in the form of oil, direct oil and gas uh, duties at the moment, but transitioning to carbon prices as soon as the political uh, situation is right. And we need to use those revenues to invest in the technologies, industries and communities for that just sustainable future. So, so back to your question, yeah, the windows are open now and we need to make sure what gets through them leads to the future we wanna see. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to everyone who participated in this live virtual taping of the Global Dispatches podcast. Uh, the episode will be available in a few days. You can find that episode and all episodes of Global Dispatches podcast by just finding Global Dispatches podcast wherever podcasts are available. Thank you all. And I will turn it over to Andrea for concluding remarks. Goodbye and thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, also from me on behalf of the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, a big thank you to Isabella Levine, to Henrik Henriksson, to Rachel Kite and to Michael Lazarus, our panelists. And thank you also to our audience. Thank you to everyone who contributed questions that were intriguing and apologies that we couldn't get all of those in. The recording of this webinar will be available in just about an hour. Um, under the same link that, that you've clicked now. In a few days, we'll also publish the video on um, SEI's YouTube channel, and we'll notify you of that via email. And of course, do look out for the Global um, Dispatches podcast on Monday. So on behalf of the Leadership Group for Industry Transition and on behalf of SEI, thank you all. Yeah. Good.